Shalom and Hag Sameach. That means happy holiday. I'm Neil and this is my wife, Jamie. Shalom. Welcome to our Fort Lauderdale home. And today we're going to become pilgrims. We're going to go up to Jerusalem to celebrate one of the three annual pilgrim feasts mentioned in the Bible. It's called Shavuot or weeks. Let me read to you from the book of Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, verse 15. And you shall count for yourself from the day after the Sabbath, from the day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be counted. That's seven weeks. Count 50 days altogether to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwelling two wave loaves, two tenths of an ephah. They shall be a fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. Those are, by the way, the only leavened loaves that are offered. We'll talk about that later. They are the first fruits to the Lord. So we, here we have Shavuot. It's a biblical feast. It has a prophetic significance. It has a historical basis. It also has relevance to every believer today. It's really the conclusion of the Passover season, and we carefully count what we call the days of the Omer from Passover to Shavuot. And many Jewish people know this by its Yiddish name, Shavuos. Uh, many Christians know it by its name, its Greek-based name, Pentecost, Shavuot, Feast of Weeks. To introduce Shavuot, we'd like to take you to Jerusalem now, where we spoke with two special men of God, one a Christian Zionist, Clarence Wagner, International Director of Bridges for Peace, and the other, Chuck Cohen, a Messianic Jew, a Kohen, who ministers for God in Jerusalem. Both men love the Lord and his favorite city. Let's hear the word of the Lord about Shavuot going forth from Jerusalem with the Tower of David in the background. Christians know Shavuot by its Greek name, Pentecost, mm -hmm. and they know from the book of Acts that on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit of God was given to the church. Right. Now, what Christians don't understand is Christian holidays have a Jewish connection. They're, very, they're Jewish holidays, and the Christians don't understand that on that holiday, the Jewish people celebrate the giving of the law right. of God. Christians often see the law as bondage and something very negative because mm -hmm. of the way it was referred to in the New Testament. But we need to understand that in Hebrew, the law is called halakha, which means the way or the walk. And right. God's word was his walk. And the Holy Spirit was given on this holiday to bring life to the word, mm -hmm. to bring life to the walk. So that as Christians, when we see the things that we are required to do, in fact, there's over a thousand commandments in the New Testament. We have the Holy Spirit to know to walk in the ways of God. And so as we celebrate the giving of the Holy Spirit, we need to say that he's the enabler, the one who can help us to walk in the laws of God, in life and in love and in light, to bring that to other people. So that's a pretty joyous occasion, I would say, Shavuot. It's a wonderful occasion. It's also a festival holiday here yeah. where they bring in the fruits from the field. And that's exciting to see the land come alive and the people bringing those celebration fruits up to God to say, thank you for providing for another year. Shavuot is very unique in the fact that it is the harvest of the Feast of the First Fruits. And on Shavuot, or as the church understands it as Pentecost, the spirit fell. Now there is a Megillah, or, a, or a, a part of the Bible that Jewish people read on Shavuot called the Book of Ruth. Interesting. On, on Shavuot, the spirit fell, and the church claims it as the birthday of the church. On Shavuot, the Jews receive Torah on Mount Sinai, and the Jewish people declare it as the birthday of Israel. And all of a sudden, we've got this story about Ruth, a Gentile brought into the house of Israel, not only brought into the house of Israel, but serving the Jewish people. And because of that, God honors her, not only with a Jewish husband who's a mighty man of God, Boaz, but she becomes the great-great-grandmother, or the great-grandmother, of King David. So she's right in the line of Messiah. How did that all start for this, this, Jew, this Gentile Moabite? She chose to serve a poor, weak Jewish woman who was cast out of her land and go back with her to her home, Bethlehem, the house of bread. Jamie, we'll talk about the Book of Ruth a little bit more later. And also about those two birthdays and why we have a birthday cake on right. the table. But, but first, a little bit more about Shavuot in general. It's a feast of harvest. And I want to reread to you this last verse from the book of Leviticus, verse 17 of chapter 23. You shall bring from your dwelling two wave loaves. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits of the Lord. The two leaven loaves represent all of the people in the world, as the Bible would call them, Ami, my people, the Jews, and Legoyim, the Gentiles. Now, Clarence mentioned that this Shavuot feast is also a celebration of the giving of the law or the Torah. 
This is not documented in the Bible. However, most scholars, the rabbis included, have determined based on the places that are mentioned and the things that happened that it very well was 50 days later from the time of Egypt departure until the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. You know, without the law, there's no knowledge of sin. All people, Jews and non-Jews, have sinned. Mm. That's why we need a Savior. And the rabbis say that although we were redeemed at the Exodus, we weren't truly free until Sinai when the law was given. And the New Testament says that it's the truth, the Word of God, that sets mm. us free. The right. law of God, the truth of God, the Word of God is very important. And the whole season of the giving of the law is called Zaman Matan Torah Tenu. And it's a special season where we rejoice in God's law. And you know, the night before Shavuot, most traditional Jews, at least the Orthodox, and a lot of Messianic Jews, such as ourselves, spend the whole night studying the Bible, studying the Word of God, and that's very special. Showing, showing that we honor the Word of God mm -hmm. and we appreciate that it was given. And those Bible studies will often, uh, will often focus on the Ten Commandments and will often focus on the Book of Ruth, the Megillah, if you will, of the Book of Ruth. In some places, a ketubah will be read, reminding us that uh, God married Israel at Mount mm -hmm. Sinai, and, and that's where the... And, of course, for any wedding, you have to have flowers. And not just any flowers. Roses are associated with Shavuot, my favorite flower, and I just love this. And uh, many times roses are throughout the synagogue, and they used to scatter rose petals. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there would also mm -hmm. be a time in the synagogue for confirmations yes. of young people, because this was the time when Israel was confirmed to God mm -hmm. by their faith at Mount Sinai. I just love the Book of Ruth and relate to it in a very personal way, as I know many of you do. We see in the Book of Ruth that God blesses those who cling to Him and to His people in love and faithfulness. I'd like to read something for you from Ruth chapter 2, verse 12. This is a special scripture. The Lord repay your work and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. What a blessing. Boaz said this to Ruth. Yeshua, our kinsman redeemer, says it to you. When Ruth's husband died, she left her own people, and she clung to her mother-in-law, Naomi, and to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. She followed Naomi's instructions to go to the threshing floor and present herself to Boaz. Perhaps you've wondered, what is a threshing floor? Well, we were at Tantur, just outside of Jerusalem, and we saw a replica of one. Dr. Randy Smith explained it to us. We're standing on a threshing floor. It's late in the afternoon, so the breezes are good, and that's what you're looking for on this piece of bedrock high up on the hill. After topping off the top of the wheat stalk after the winter wheat, you take about the top old 12 inches off and lay it on the, the threshing floor. And then take a sled. We have one here from about 150 years ago. Uh, by taking this piece of wood and inserting stone or metal into it, you could actually lay it down on, on top of the uh, material to be threshed, and uh, an animal would pull you over the sled as you crush all of the wheat and all of the uh, stalk. After that, you're going to separate the stalk from the uh, grain itself. And so we have some separators that you can use to separate. Uh, this is a relatively recent kind. They used to use basket weaves as well. And you'd put all of the uh, material that's on the threshing floor inside, separating the grain, all of the stalk would be left. You'd take the stalk and put it to the side so that you could sleep on it next to your store of grain, uh, as Boaz did in, uh, in the Book of Ruth. And then uh, take later on, you would begin to use a winnowing fork to lift up all of the wheat and separate the wheat from the chaff, which would blow against the edges of the threshing floor. At the end, what you'd be left with was the the, the grain itself that you could trade in the market for all of the, your goods for the rest of the year. And this becomes the setting to things like uh, the Book of Ruth returning uh, Naomi and uh, uh, Ruth coming back to the threshing floor and uncovering Boaz's feet late at night on his threshing floor. And of course, he wakes up in the middle of the night and he has two problems. One is he has cold feet, and the other one is he's at a threshing floor in the middle of the night with a woman alone, which is very bad. But the setting for that is all the threshing floor, and that's a good backdrop for a uh, celebration of Shavuot. Thanks, Randy. If you enjoyed that explanation, come with us to Israel sometime. You'll also see many, many beautiful roses. Now, Shavuot is associated with dairy foods. It seems that all our holidays are associated with foods, but dairy because the scriptures have references to the words of the Torah being like milk. Uh, they're also a sign of humility. Dairy is considered to be a humble food, and so knowledge of the Torah causes one to be humble. The most famous of the Shavuot foods of all is blintzes. Come now and join Jamie in the kitchen, and you'll learn how to make this delicious treat.
Shalom, and welcome to my Fort Lauderdale kitchen where I have a very special guest today from our Jewish Jewels office, our office manager, Cheryl, who is a balabusta. Cheryl is comfortable in our office, but she is really at home in the kitchen. Wouldn't you say that, Cheryl? Yes, I love to cook. And who taught you how to cook? Well, my grandmother Vera taught me everything that I know. It's the old European way. Uh huh. No and we recipes. actually at, have something of Vera's here today. That's yeah, her pan. Yeah, this is her frying pan. It must be so over 50 years old. And you use that to make a traditional Jewish dish called blintzes, which are special sh for Shavuot. Blintz is a diminutive of the word blin, which means pancake. So we're, we're having a, a pancake mix this here. Is this Jewish is a Jewish like pancake. Right. right. Okay, and what else do you need to put in there? First of all, what's in the bowl? Well, I started off with two extra large eggs, a quarter teaspoon salt, a third of a cup of milk, and one cup of flour. Mm -hmm. You add the flour last, and you mix it until it's very smooth, make sure there's no lumps. And at that point, I have my other third of a cup of milk that I'm going to be adding and just stirring in gently okay. until it's just all incorporated. And that's what forms your basic blintz uh, batter. Mm -hmm. Just get that milk that's stirred in here. Let's get the frying pan okay. on the Now, the heat. frying pan has to be hot, you told me. Yeah, the frying pan has to be hot, and you just check it. Just put okay, a little, little, uh, little pinch of oil. water, and if it, if it sizzles, that's not quite hot. It needs to sizzle before you start putting it in, otherwise it'll stick. Just when, as soon as that water dries up, we can just put a tiny okay. drop of butter can on I the pan. Can I do that? That's all you need. Tell me you when. You don't need much. Just put it on the pan. Okay, like this? Right. And you only have to grease the pan every two or three blintzes. Okay. Uh, that's all? That's all. And you okay. do not each time. Right. And now what you do is once you have the batter, I start, uh, I measure three tablespoons into a small little dish. Like a little demi-tasse cup you're little using there? A little demi-tasse cup, three, three and a half tablespoons. Uh, each pan is different. This happens to be a five and a half inch pan. If you mm -hmm. have a bigger pan, then you have a bigger blitz. <laughs> and then you use more batter. Okay. <laughs> so you start off, and uh, it's all in the wrist action. I see. Uh, you take the, the batter oh. and just swirl it around your pan there. Make sure it covers everything. Okay. And I just keep swirling to make sure all the batter doesn't wind up in one spot. Now, how long is this going to cook? A minute top, sometimes 40 seconds, and you'll see the batter starts to dry up from around the edges right. and get almost rubbery to the feel. Uh -huh. When everything's dried up and you don't see any um, liquid parts anymore, you right. just turn it right out onto this paper bag here. Uh -huh. yeah. And then you're going to be filling it with something. Right. We're going to fill it with a cheese mixture. And then mm -hmm. here I have uh, two, a pound of farmer cheese, two egg yolks, a quarter of a cup of sugar, four ounces of cream cheese, and a half a teaspoon vanilla. Okay, you know this is ready when it all dries oh, up. Look at that. It just, and it's <gasps> almost rubbery to the feel. That's because it has this a heavy This is so egg exciting. I, right. We're learning how to make blintzes. In the this meantime, I mean, I know in my little dish it's halfway, three tablespoons. You get your next one ready, and you get ready to pour the second one. Great. Now we have to fill that other one, Cheryl. Right. Okay, that'll be ready in about one minute. Cheryl, what did your grandmother call that? It's called bletla. Okay. One of them is called a bletl. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's hard to say, but it tastes delicious. Uh, what I generally do in my kitchen is after I have them all made, and the recipe makes about 12. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't really want a pachka for less than 12. All right. <laughs> uh, I generally lay all of them out, so this way I can just divide all my cheese among the, the blintzes. Why are they on brown do, paper? Uh, I find that the brown paper, they, they slide easily, it absorbs the extra moisture, they don't mm -hmm. get rubbery, mm -hmm. and I'll put it out on the paper, and then by the time the next one's cooking, I'll just move them over and just line them up. Okay. I just find it really works good. We made everything on brown paper. Okay. Uh, you take about a tablespoon of the cheese mixture, and you put it at the bottom end of your bottle. Okay. And again, if you have them all lined up, you just divide it evenly. You may have a little bit too much in one. Then you just start at the end, and you just roll them up. And what I would generally do is I roll them all up this way first. Mm -hmm. And then once you have this done, you just pick it up and tuck in your sides. You don't want the cheese to come, come out, out while you're frying them. This is not a finished blintz at this point. What do you do next? What you have to do... Let's just tuck that one in there. I have some already made here on the platter. Okay. And what you do now is you put them in a frying pan mm -hmm. with a small amount of oil, maybe a tablespoon of oil, just enough to coat the bottom. Right. And you put them in and you fry them golden on all four sides. Okay. And when, after you fry them, they come out looking this like this. This is how they come and out. And you serve them with 
cherries, cherries, or with blueberries, sour cream. any fruit filling. Uh, sometimes they're filled with fruit or potatoes, but uh -huh. again, we have them filled with cheese today. Okay. And let's see, we have to sample this. A blintz. A blintz. Oh, sure. Oh, Grandma, mm -hmm. you taught me good. Thank you. <laughs> Delicious. Right for the recipe. Often, two blintzes are served together as a reminder of the two tablets of the law. They look kind of a little bit like miniature Torah scrolls, and, and when you eat one, it's as if you were putting the Word of God on the inside of you. You can get the recipe from our website at jewishjewels.org. Simply select the Resources drop-down menu and then choose Recipes. Each of the Jewish holidays also has a New Covenant significance. They are all explained in this booklet, the Biblical Significance of the Jewish Holidays. You can download a free copy from our website at jewishjewels.org. Simply select the Resources drop-down menu and then choose Jewish Holidays. Remember, that's jewishjewels.org, then Resources, and select Jewish Holidays. And now we'd like to make the connection between Shavuot and Pentecost. Mm. Shavuot was beautifully fulfilled on the exact day, just as Passover was fulfilled, when Yeshua became the eternal sacrificial Lamb, lamb and the Jewish feast of first fruits was fulfilled Yom when he, rode, he rose fruits, from the dead. From the so dead. what happened to Shavuot? The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 6. It's very exciting. Now when the day of Shavuot had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Mm. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Now these were Jewish men celebrating a Jewish feast in a Jewish place. You know, most probably it was the temple. Most probably in the temple, Because right? it was called the house or and the house of the Lord. And they were all in one accord because they were studying the scriptures. That's, That's what right. they would have done. They came up to Jerusalem as commanded by God three times a year for the Shalosh Regalim, the pilgrim feasts. And uh, this was one of them. And, there and, are so many parallels. And there, there are a lot of parallels. So first of all, Let's we have through them. Okay. Mount Sinai, the giving of the law. Okay. Then Mount Zion in Jerusalem, of course, giving of the Holy Spirit, the right. Ruach HaKodesh. It's normally considered to be the birthday of Judaism. Because the law was given. Because the law was given. And it's considered the birthday of the church because at the point when the Holy Spirit was given, the body of believers was unified. They became a unit. And that's why we have the birthday cake. That's and right. And on the birthday cake it, it says, says, Happy Birthday. Judaism on one side. The church, and the church on the other side. And there's the star right. with the line going through it. It's because it's two birthdays in one. Right. Okay. Right. One represented the receiving of the Torah, which made the Israelites a cohesive people mm -hmm. with a calling, a priestly, priestly calling. calling. Exodus God. chapter 19, verses 5 to 6. You'll have to read that yourself no time. Okay. Receiving the Spirit made the believers a a cohesive group, as I said, with a priestly, priestly calling. calling. First Peter 2 9 says that we are now a royal priesthood. Yeah, and the although Lord. there was fear at Mount Sinai when the word of God was proclaimed, it was received with great joy. Everything that God has said, we will do it. Mm -hmm. And how about it? Great joy in the Holy Spirit when, when the Spirit was given. And when the divine presence of God descended on Mount Sinai, there was thundering, there was lightning. Mm -hmm. And there were tongues of fire, and the house was shaken when the Spirit was given. And for Shavuot, it's a celebration of the physical harvest time. For Pentecost, the spiritual harvest. And at the celebration at Shavuot, when the law was given, remember, while Moses was up on the mountain getting it, there was a rebellion. They built the golden. 3,000 uh -huh. died. Very interesting. When the Spirit was given, the Bible tells us that 3,000 people were saved. They became believers in the Lord at Acts 2.41. And I have a note here that Temple Mount ex excavations have shown that there were 48 mikvah oath they've discovered right. already, and there could Places have been 200. Because when these 3,000 became believers, they had their mikvah. To, signifying that they were submitting themselves to the teaching right. of Yeshua. And how could you immerse 3,000 people unless they could, the archaeologists could find enough mikvah, to, and they found Shavuot them. Shavuot represents the law on the outside. And Pentecost, the law on the yeah. inside. What happened in Jerusalem can be seen as a second giving of the law, a reenactment of what had happened on Mount Sinai, a giving of the law by the Holy Spirit, writing the law on our hearts, 
fulfilling the promise that God had made through the prophet Jeremiah. Tanta Rose has experienced that fulfillment. We talked with her about some of her childhood memories of Shavuot, making butter, making cheese. We'll let her tell you the rest. I didn't remember if we went to the synagogue. Uh -huh. Or to the shtibu. Or to the shtibu, <laughs> right? You do remember. You yeah. know the difference. The, the shtibu, shtibu was your grandfather had a temple like in his own house. Well, uh, he set aside one room. Uh -huh. And they, it was the Torah and everything. But mainly we used to go to, uh, to the synagogue because that was good when we didn't have a synagogue. Right. And so you celebrated and the giving of the law. We, we celebrated giving of the law by going to the synagogue, mm -hmm. praying, and I believe we read the book of Ruth, mm -hmm. and Mother telling us stories, and Bobby telling us things, and giving us treats. And what's different now as a Messianic Jewish person celebrating Shavuot. How is it special to you? How is it different? Well, actually, Jamie, we have, as believers in the Lord, we have Shavuot every single day. We don't have to wait for the laws to come, mm -hmm. for us to celebrate. We celebrate the laws every day. We have the Lord. What more could he do? He gave himself for us. Mm -hmm. And if that wasn't enough, he sent down the Ruach HaKodesh, the Comforter, right. to comfort us every single day, every moment of 24 hours. What a wonderful reality for a widow and a Holocaust survivor, to know God 24 hours a day, to be comforted by him, to experience the reality of his presence in your life, the law on the inside. You know, the law on the outside is legalism, but the law on the inside only can really lead to spiritual anarchy, where everybody does that which is right in their own lives. We need both. The Spirit in us, the law in us, enabling us to walk in the ways of Yeshua. What a wonderful concept. I talked with Jeremy, who's captured the sense of that. Jeremy Storcher, praise and worship leader, Messianic rabbi, a good friend. He's captured the sense of that in a song that he wrote about the joy of this feast, the law on the inside. And he's joined by the Temple around HaKodesh dancers. I've got the joy I've got the joy I've got the joy of the Lord deep in my soul Yeshua gave me the joy I've got the joy I've got the joy I've got the joy of the Lord Deep in my soul I've got the joy of the Lord I've got the joy I've got the joy I've got the joy of the Lord Soul, I've got the joy of the Lord. My feet want to dance, my hands want to wave, I want to jump up and shout because my heart's filled with praise. Deep in my soul, I've got the joy of the Lord. I've got the joy, I've got the joy, I've got the joy of the Lord. Deep in my soul, I've got the joy of the Lord. My 
soul I've got the joy of the Lord That joy that Jeremy sang about is God's best for all of us, to the Jew first and also to the non-Jew. We've been talking about two birthdays today, the birthday of Judaism at Shavuot, the birthday of the church at Pentecost. But you know, there's a third birthday mm. that God wants you to know about, and that's a spiritual birthday. And it can be your spiritual birthday today as the law of God is written on the inside, on your heart, through the Ruach HaKodesh. Now, it was the prophet Jeremiah that spoke about that law on the inside. I'd like Neil to read that scripture to you from Jeremiah chapter 31. Neil? But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, this new covenant. In those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people. And no more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Now that's joy. To have God's law on the inside, and that new beginning, forgiven. that new starting can be yours today. What do you have to do? Some of you have been watching us for a long time, but today is the day, your spiritual birthday. As you say with me, Yeshua, I want God's law on the inside on my heart. Thank you that through your death, through your atonement, you made that possible. Forgive me of my sins. I receive Yeshua as my Savior as my Lord, as the atonement for me. Thank you for a new beginning, a new start today. Yeshua, Jesus, the middle wall of partition is broken down. Male, female, Jew, Gentile, all one in the Messiah. 